Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives, and advocates from around the world to meet, network, and forge new scientific collaborations. Many thanks to the organizers for the chance to look at not just life extension and healthy aging today, but I'm going to look ahead 10 years, 20 years, 30 years into the future. What might we be talking about in EHA 20, EHA 24, EHA 30, and so forth. And I'm going to do this as a futurist, and just a brief mention of what futurists try to do. I want to encourage all of you, by the way, to become futurists. It means that from time to time we take our mind away from the busy pressures of business as usual. There are people sailing the ship of the politics or sailing the ship of business or organization, and a futurist is like the little boy who climbs to the top and looks out into the future, not to see what will happen, because nobody has a crystal ball that can, can guarantee what will happen, but to look at possible scenarios. And the little boy at the top of the mast says, could that be a pirate ship out there? Could it be some buried rocks we have to pay attention to? Let's consider it. Maybe there's a threat that's more serious than we expected. And equally, he may say, ah, that looks like it might be an opportunity. There might be some buried treasure there. And if we are quick enough and nimble enough, we can seize that opportunity. But if we are preoccupied just with the business of the moment, the politics of today, we may miss both these threats and the opportunities. It's hard to evaluate these things seriously because we have to cope with the acceleration of technology. We have to cope with the fact that the technology often spends a long time being overhyped before it suddenly breaks through and changes everything. And it's hard also because there are multiple different factors we have to take into account. But I will do my best in the next 35 minutes to talk us through some scenarios, including some threats and some big opportunities for the future of healthy life extension. In general, we futurists like to move beyond hindsight of the past and insight about the present to get foresight, not about the future, as I said, but about future scenarios. And we look at these scenarios wherever they come from. And for each of these scenarios, there are three questions that we try and ask. We try and ask, is this actually credible? OK, it might be a nice Hollywood movie, but is the science in it sensible? Is it uh, just uh, dystopian uh, science fiction? So is it technically credible? But also, is it socially credible? Because sometimes things are technically possible, but they're unlikely to happen because of social factors. And let's give an example, an example from the past, an example of these diseases, which you might be able to guess. Diseases which are causing havoc throughout many parts of Africa and the lesser developed worlds. Diseases whose names maybe many of us don't even know, but they all share the f feature that they are neglected. So this is some information from the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. And as we know, the people who can cure these diseases aren't always motivated just by curing diseases. As here, Marin Deckers, the chief executive officer for Bayer, was quoted in an argument about use of some of his treatments. He said, we did not develop this medicine for Indians, people living in India who can't pay much money. We developed it for Western patients who can't afford it. So he was criticized for what he said. Maybe he was just saying the, the correct thing in a politically unacceptable way. So it's no surprise that these neglected disease account 
by some estimates for at least 11% of the global disease burden, but very few treatments are targeted at them. Of the new therapeutic products from 2000 to 2011, only 4% targeted these neglected diseases. And if you look at brand new chemical entities, only 1%. So you may say this is an example of a market failure, that the market's not doing the right thing, or you may say the market's being perfectly rational, promoting uh, profits, and it's a political failure. But either way, it's an example that something that is technically possible doesn't mean it will happen. So we ask as futurists what's credible. The second question we look at is which of these credible scenarios are desirable, and we have to help people beyond their initial reactions. Sometimes people say, wow, this would be wonderful. Sometimes people say, yuck, this would be awful. In both cases, these initial future shock reactions can be misleading, and we need to take the time to weigh it up calmly. And the third scale of a futurist is to help people figure out, all right, how do we steer towards the best scenario, and how do we prepare for the scenarios that are likely? So I'm going to do that now with scenarios for the future of life extension. And to make it more interesting, I'm going to look at a particular person. Some of you may know her. Her name is Eve. She was born on uh, Longevity Day, 1976, October the 1st. So that means it's her birthday today. It's a big birthday. In fact, she is 40 years old today. So some of you may say, oh, she's getting old. Some of you may say she's pretty young. Eve herself has been a bit philosophical. She knows that when she was born, in the UK, the average life expectancy was 76 years old. And she did GCSE math. She knows that 40 is more than 70, half of 76. So she's got a bit pessimistic and uh, melancholy on her big birthday. More than half her life has passed. So you may have some advice from her, but let's just follow through the story. Because actually last night, Eve went to La Mort Subito. And she was talking to some crazy people in the pub, and some of them told her, don't worry, you know, life expectancy is increasing. It's true that when you were born, the average age of death for women in the UK was 76, but you know, it's getting better. And a young man in the pub took out a piece of paper that he carries around with him, a famous chart from Jim Open and James Vopo from 2002 that tracks the increase in life expectancy around the world in the countries where at the time the best uh, uh, records of good life expectancy were kept. And over this 160 year period from 1840 to 2000, life expectancy measured like this has gone up from about 45 to 85. That's 40 years improvement over 160 years. That means every year that somebody lives they can expect another three months of life expectancy compared to what it was before. Every 10 years that somebody lives, you may get two and a half extra years. And so if you live 40 years and you remain statistically average, it means you've only used up 30 years of your life expectancy. So this young man in Lamor Subito talked to Eve and said, you know, you haven't used up 40 years of your 76 years of life expectancy, you've only used up 30. You can look ahead to another 46 years. So Eve got thinking, well, if I live uh, longer, another 40 years, I'll get another 10 years if this trend continues. So how long could she actually expect to live if that trend continues? Although when she was born, she thought it was 76. If you do the maths, it works out to 101. So I will call this the optimistic scenario. It's made Eve cheer up a bit. And what we should do collectively is figure out, will this trend continue? Might the trend change? Might it slow down? Might it speed up? And we have the philosophical question, as I said, do we want it to slow down or speed up? And then we have the activist question. If we want it to do either of these things, what can we do about it? So this is the optimistic scenario. But Eve went home from the pub. She said, I've got to research this for myself. And she ended up with a realistic scenario because she went to the World Data Bank and she downloaded more accurate statistics. And it looks like this. Uh, when she was born, yes, in Britain, the average expectancy of somebody in her situation would live to 75.9. In Britain, it's only come to 82.7 today. 
You might notice if you look closely, it seems to be slowing down at the top. We'll come back to that. So Eve does her mathematics, and she's only gained 6.8 years, and every decade, therefore, not two and a half years of improvement, 1.7 years. And she does the mathematics, and she thinks, well, I won't make 101 if I'm statistically average, but I might reach 91 and a half, which is more than she was thinking before. But she also reading more online, and it fi she finds out there's quite a lot of people, even though they live longer, they spend a long time being ill with various diseases. So maybe she may have a longer lifespan, but not necessarily a longer health span. And she's also worried that our pension provisions may not be enough. So this is a slightly less exciting possibility. And I'll come back to this, but let's give some more evidence as to why that optimistic scenario is a bit too optimistic. And we can look at another set of data. Let's look at the data for not the average life expectancy, but the longest that anybody has ever lived. So the longest that anybody has ever lived, normally when I'm in audiences, people take a while to get that right. In this audience, everybody knows. Uh, Jean-Louis Calmont lived uh, 122 and a half years, but she died 19 years ago, which is a long time ago if uh, science and medicine was really making lots of improvements. What about the second longest verified lifespan? 119 years by this American lady who died a few hours before the new millennium. So she also died in the last century. In fact, if we go to Wikipedia, the four oldest people who ever lived all died in the last century. We are not seeing these records being broken in a regular basis at the top. And if you want to be more realistic, we can also look at this remarkable chart, Erum's Law. Erum is Moore's Law spelled backwards. Moore's Law talks about technology is accelerating. Erum's Law looks hard and cold at how much money it takes to get drugs developed. It's been coming down steadily from the 1950s to the present date, and roughly every nine years, the drug development cost doubles. So these are reasons for taking the realistic scenario more realistically than the optimistic one. But it gets worse. I want to talk about a pessimistic scenario, which we should also think about, which is that in some parts of the world, life expectancy is actually dropping. And although you shouldn't believe everything you read in the newspapers, actually the Wall Street Journal and the Daily Telegraph both report actual uh, confirmed facts. There is a decline, as you sort of saw in that earlier graph. And the BBC even asks, will today's children die earlier than their parents? And I think the right answer to that is maybe. There is a lot of people with bad diet, you know, more than 200 years ago, the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette, got her head cut off for giving advice to the poor. She said, if you don't have any bread, eat cake, uh, allegedly. Uh, well, nowadays, that advice is being heard and acted on by poor people around the world, eating lots of cake and uh, diet cola and so on. Diet is poor, lifestyle is poor. It gets worse. The life expectancy gap between the rich and the poor it's always existed. If you were born in a rich circumstances, you always tended to live longer than people born into poor circumstances, but the gap is accelerating. So in America, and somebody born in the 1920s, if you were rich, you would likely live six years longer than somebody who was poor. Nowadays, uh, somebody born in the 1950s, the male life expectancy has different by 14 years. It's the same with women. In fact, there's even more of a step up there. So you are going to hear not just about good news, you're going to hear people increasingly talking about the longevity gap, driven by all kinds of things, driven by bad diet, bad lifestyle, people getting depressed, people feeling alienated, people feeling left out, a perception of inequality, people turning to various kinds of addiction, drink and drugs, leading them to a spiraling downhill in their health and a downhill in social health, a growing unrest. So the three scenarios I've talked about so far, 
can be put on a diagram as follows. There's the chart showing the historical trends. Here's the optimistic scenario in which people continue to gain three more years of life every year that passes. There's the realistic scenario and the pessimistic scenario coming downhill. I have to say, if nothing changes, if things continue as they are today, my bets are for something in these scenario for the future, unless there is a disruption in medicine. And that's what the next part of my talk is about. I want to talk about the nature of disruption, and then I'll say what disruptions I think are feasible and desirable within medicine. So my background's not in the medical world. I spent 25 years in the mobile computing and smartphone industry, and that is an industry which there has been lots of disruption, as you know. Ten years ago, if you had a phone in your pocket, it might have been a Blackberry or a Palm Pilot or a Motorola or a Nokia. Some of you may have been running software from the company I co-founded, Symbian. All of these companies, great giants of the mobile industry, 10 years ago, are fractions of their present, uh, pra fractions of their former selves today. You may just about remember the names of these companies. That's just one example of disruption. If I had more time, I would look at how there's been disruption in all kinds of other computer industries. These companies here, Data General, Wang, Apollo, were the darlings in the 1970s and 80s of the mini computer market. All of the names are almost forgotten. We could talk about the disruption by digital music, by digital photography, by digital movies, by digital books, digital news, digital encyclopedias, and by next generation search engines. In all these cases, great companies, great methods, successful giants were disrupted by new methods of things being done. And I don't have time to explore any of these today, but I will just briefly show a chart of the disruptions in that smartphone industry. Why? Because I'm going to draw a same chart in a few minutes of disruptions in the healthcare industry. So here's the kind of phase one of smartphones with these companies. They had actually overtaken and uh, surpassed the previous phones from other companies, some of them the same. There was a slow disruption that took place. Eventually, these new phones got everywhere. And then eventually, there was another big disruption in which Apple and Google brought a new, higher caliber, more powerful software systems. You know, we moved from software being relatively unimportant to software being important, as these devices were many computers, to recognizing that modern smartphones are supercomputers in their own right, with more processing power on a single smartphone than all the computers used by NASA to navigate Apollo 11 to the moon and back. You might say this shows the story of software eating the world in the famous phrase of the venture capitalist Mark Andreessen, and that's true. And I do think software is going to eat and transform the medical industry and healthcare and longevity in the same way. It also shows that the future arrives in waves as wave of disruption follows wave of disruption. So the disruption I have in mind for the healthcare industry is uh, going to take a while. Disruptions do take a time. And here's the sort of simple picture. A new platform is there. People get excited about it. Technology enthusiasts write about it. But it takes a long time to overtake what was there previously. So digital music took a long time to really replace analog music. Digital currencies is going to take a while to replace the previous currencies. New smartphone platforms took a while to build up usability, to build up applications and services to get the design right. So there's a period of time in which everybody says, we've heard this before, nothing's happening. And then it moves from slow and disappointing to fast and frightening or exciting, depending on your point of view. And the companies that were great in the former era often fail in that transition. To summarize that complicated picture, I'll quote Amara's Law from one of the pioneers of the field of, of futurism. We all tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run, but underestimate the effect in the long run. There's variants of this. We tend to overestimate the effect of AI in the short run and underestimate the effect of AI in the long run. That We tend to overestimate the effect of nanotechnology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. So the disruption I have in mind is a change from the traditional way in which people have treated individual diseases by concentrating on the disease. 
and people have said these diseases are quite different and yes sometimes people have them both at the same time comorbidity and that's complicated but you know you've got to study each of these diseases because they've each got their own trajectory they need their own investigation their own treatment and as for aging historically people have said well we're not sure if that's a disease or not we're going to leave it to last anyway it's so hard let's focus on these other treatments that is the story of medicine for most of history and the disruption, the first disruption that's ahead, is a sort of Copernican revolution in which the disease is moved to the periphery and aging takes center stage. And here I'm quoting from Dr. Felipe Sierra from the uh, Gero Science Interest Group in America. Because, as we know in this room, but is not so well known more widely, the older you get, the more likely you are to get these diseases, and also the more severe you will be affected by these diseases. And what's interesting, what we can do now that we couldn't do in the past, is that we can look inside that bubble and we can see a number of things which are acting at the chemical, the biochemical, the cellular levels. And we have plans in mind to treat each of these. The plans are only partially developed. And I know other analysts will put different things in here, maybe nine things instead of seven things. And people will say maybe there's one or two others that should go in. But the point is we have ideas on how to solve these things. And therefore, the scenario that maybe is we move away from this focus on individual diseases with aging being relatively unstudied. That's the basis for what I've called the realistic scenario. And we might get more and more people focusing on addressing aging in its own right, delaying aging. I date the start of serious work on this from the 1980s. We can talk about that afterwards in which people found genetic changes that would start, they started to find genetic changes. People like Michael Rose, who did his PhD in Sussex. He's done all these experiments with fruit flies, eventually extending their lifespan fourfold. People in America and Cynthia Kenyon's lab and others who've done all kinds of things with single genetic changes, as you saw in the last couple of days, to extend lifespan eventually, in some cases, by tenfold. So we have uh, figured out that what we were told on our grandmother's knee as we learnt evolutionary biology at school, we were taught that evolution knows best and you can't do better than evolution. It turns out we can. So from the 1980s, we've known that. We have started developing some drugs. Again, it's early days. People looking at rapamycin, uh, there's the TAME test, uh, which uh, hopefully neurobasilai will get funding for. People are looking as well at the scientific basis for why various lifestyle changes, such as intermittent calorie restriction or various kinds of stress exercises, why they will extend life. The point isn't to look at the individual cases. The point is to consider, could this get involved in a positive feedback cycle with more and more people building on each other's research and therefore turn this from an early hyped stage, uh, disappointing stage with little to show, into something that does surpass traditional medicine approaches. And for this to work, we need to get this positive feedback cycle working. I have lots of slides I could share you about how positive feedback cycles work. I'll just uh, do two. The reason we've got more technology in the world, the reason technology is accelerating, is because we have more people in the world being educated about technology. But as technology improves, education improves too. We have YouTube videos that show people all over the world about the latest technological possibilities. We have online courses, which are free in many cases. We have open source. We have better mechanisms for open source. We have AIs, tutors, and so on. Let's build that picture out. We have more people around the world educated to higher levels than ever before, networked together more than ever before, using tools to improve their collaboration, and therefore building better technology, which in turn uh, helps that cycle go faster. So, as I've said, we have more engineers, more entrepreneurs, more designers, more educators, more integrators, more tools such as artificial intelligence and deep learning than ever before. So that is why overall we are seeing an acceleration of technology, and that is why overall we're seeing an acceleration of disruption. But the key question is, can we make such a cycle work in the fields of a healthy uh, medicine as we would like? If we can, then we have hope that the optimistic scenario could take place. But I think there's a second disruption that lies ahead too. 
As I said, the future comes in waves. There is a possible second wave, which has been talked about in this conference as well. I think serious work on that is just starting. Uh, the abolition of aging, the reversal of aging by removing damage. So it's not just slowing down the rate at which damage uh, is uh, accumulated. It is doing that, certainly, but it's removing damage by technologies which are still in very early phase. They're still in the disappointing phase. There's nanotech, stem cell therapy, gene engineering, 3D printing, and the use of second-generation AI, deep learning. And together, they might generate another positive feedback cycle which will propel forwards. And if we do that, we'll end up with a fourth scenario to consider alongside the three I previously mentioned. We can do even better than the optimistic scenario in which we might gain three more year, months every year that we live if we remain statistically average. We might see in a few years' time, it's not yet, we might see the start of this abolitionist scenario in which actually people would gain at least 12 months of life expectancy every year they continued living. So-called the longevity escape velocity. Taking advantage of these technologies, putting humans in the situation that they can choose if they wish to become ageless. So that is the second possible transformation that lies ahead. If the positive feedback cycles work, if more and more people are able to get involved, build productively on each other's solutions, if the different technologies can be integrated together wisely, I see an acceleration of what I've called rejuvenating. Uh, after Aubrey de Grey mentioned it once, the engineering of rejuvenating, which could accelerate so that I think, and I'll give my reasons for saying this shortly, I think that by 2040, there is the possibility that uh, these treatments will be widespread and affordable and reliable. I've written up the argument in more details in this book, and I'm just giving you a very quick summary of that now. It certainly requires still lots of technological and medical improvements, enhancements. It requires a change in mind, which I'll be talking about as well, and it also requires better collaboration, better politics, in other words. So here's why I've picked that date, 2040. I think that the, the serious work on rejuvenation biotechnology, as I mentioned, kicked off in the 1980s. I haven't tried exhaustively to count the number of people involved, but it was only a handful to start off with. But, you know, as uh, results were published, as people found out that things were possible, it wasn't just uh, crazy people talking, there were actual experiments which showed changes, then maybe each decade, I think there can be 10 times as many people building on each other's work. So I don't know how many people are working on this field today, but there's certainly lots of publications, perhaps in the tens of thousands. And we can look ahead. If people feel that it's worthwhile getting into, if the collaboration if capabilities are there, there might be uh, millions of people in the late 2030s working on this, people coming from all different sources, from the cosmetics industry who are interested, at least some of them, not just in making us look younger, but actually feeling younger and being younger. Interest from the military, the sports, the food, the pharmaceutical industry, at least part of it, IT industry. And interest and contributions as well, I believe, from many people who I would call citizen scientists. People who aren't uh, engaged in their day job in some of these fields, but who are able to take advantage of the open source material, the online courses to learn about it and get involved too. And so that's why I think it is at least possible that these treatments will be available by around 2040 in wide use. It is possible that by that time the world record for longevity will have been broken comprehensively and we'll have 120 year olds who are pretty athletic and we might even say then 120 is the new 80. But only about 50% likely, I think, and it would require society to decide this is something it's worth doing. If it's something that's worth doing, we, and there are collaboration methods, and we can take advantage of artificial intelligence and big data and analysts to spot the patterns which are uh, not so obvious to us, and if there are motivated people, then we can have rejuvenation therapies being created uh, big time. So let's briefly talk about motivation. Many people say to me, David, you're just afraid of dying. That's why you spend all your time on this. And I say it's not about fearing death, it's about loving life, it's about what's said in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations, everybody has the right to life. 
It doesn't say you only have the right to life if you live in Europe or if you're a man or if you're white or if you're less than 80 years old. It's a universal declaration. And I do think death is a tragedy. It's a loss of knowledge. Libraries burning down effectively. All the insight and wisdom goes away. But I also point to yet another motivation, a motivation that's going to be more and more in the public discussion. It is the financial motivation. People are talking increasingly about the longevity dividend, that if we invest some money in doing this, and it'll be a, quite a lot of money, it will actually save us even more in time. And the spiraling costs that I referred to earlier, that more and more of the healthcare budgets, more and more of national budgets are spent on treating people with diseases, including diseases of aging, that we can avoid all that by doing this preventive rejuvenation biotech. The longevity dividend was discussed first by J.L. Shansky. He and a couple of co-writers have written this rather expensive book recently that uh, highlights the arguments in favor of it. It's even being picked up in The Economist in their show in London in a couple of months' time. They put on their website, we're going to reap the longevity dividend. The idea comes also from a couple of Chicago economists who more than 10 years ago said, you know, if we analyze what's happened in America, because people are living longer and healthier, it's boosted the American uh, economy by $95 trillion. And yes, of course, it did cost money to build up the medical systems, maybe $34 trillion. But if you spend $34 trillion and you get $95 trillion out, that's something worth doing. So you're going to hear more about the longevity dividend. It's going to increasingly, in my view, lead governments to say we should actually put more resources in this direction. Now, many people, of course, have a different pessimistic assessment. They say, well, if people live longer, where are they all going to live? People are consuming of resources. I'm not worried about that personally. I look at this picture. This shows where half the world lives in yellow. That is just 1% of the land. The other half of the world's population is spread out over 99%. There's plenty of space on the planet if we organize things well, if we get our politics right for many more people. In fact, the biggest determinant of population, it's not the death rate, it's the birth rate. If people stop dying, and I'm not promising that, of course, but even if the, everybody who was going to die from aging could be treated so they wouldn't die from aging, and even if that was everybody in the world, it would still take 17 years to grow the population by another billion. It would take more than a century for the population to double. And even if the population did double, we could still all fit comfortably in the state of Texas alone. Uh, if you put 14 billion people in groups of, say, two on average, they would each have 100 square meters for their house, which is actually more than the average uh, area of a house in the UK. I'm not saying we should actually do that, don't worry. I'm just using this to say there's plenty of space on this planet. And there'll be plenty more space as we build up into sky with eco skyscrapers. And in 100 years' time, surely we'll have habitable space stations as well. When people complain about overpopulation, they're more talking about, uh, well, is there enough food? Is there enough water? Is there enough energy? And I say, sure. Again, the technology is within our grasp. It's just a matter of sorting out the politics. More worrying is the waste that all these people are increasingly producing, not the number of people, but how affluent a lifestyle, how much uh, carbon dioxide we're emitting. And I do worry about this. I do think it might lead to all kinds of problems. It might lead to uh, worsening politics rather than better politics. But if we handle it well, I see no reason why we can't be better copying from nature, recycling our waste in a harmonious way. So that's just one ob objection people raise. Don't have time to go into all the objections. We're going to discuss some of them later today. But what I want to point out is there's a set of different beliefs which sort of reinforce each other. There's a whole bunch of beliefs people have as to why it can't be done, why it's technically impossible. We could go into some of these, if you like, later in the day. Yes, it's incredibly complicated, but, you know, learning to fly was incredibly complicated. That took ages. There were a lot of failures, and eventually people figured out how to do it. These Technical objections are linked with various uh, philosophical objections, some of which uh, we've talked about. Some of them are more serious, some of them are less serious. Uh, I spent a long time in my book answering all of these. 
underlying a lot of this is, I think for many people, this is too frightening to think about. People are frightened about this because they've carved off in their mind uh, that they don't think about death because death is a horrible thing and they've created lots of culture and lots of excuses and if this idea is brought to them they get psychologically disturbed. I'll say more about that in a minute just as the conclusion. But anyway, this reinforcing set of views forms a paradigm accepting aging and I want to move people away from that accepting aging paradigm. It's like seeing this picture and saying I know that's a duck to seeing things from a different perspective, oh, that's a rabbit, and which turns out to be a, a more positive way of looking. Sometimes it's easy to change paradigm, as you can do here. You can look at it, and then you can blink, and you can see it from the other perspective as well. Sometimes people get more locked into what they see, and they argue more vociferously, because there's a whole bunch of things keeping them in one direction. I think many op op opponents of the possibility of rejuvenation biotechnology, they fear lots of things, consciously and subconsciously. They may be afraid that, well, if there's too many people, we won't be allowed to have children, that will be terrible. They may say, yeah, it might be good for me, but you know, we should be, shouldn't be selfish. Often there are things which are good for individuals, but bad for society. I don't want to be such a person, that's what they may be thinking. They may be afraid of this longevity gap which might be a serious thing, and indeed one of the most interesting new books recently by Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus, talks at some length about the possibility that in the near future humanity will fragment or bifurcate into near gods who have near immortality and uh, all kinds of happiness, and the near useless, which is everybody else who gets some of the crumbs of progress. And people say they don't want that future, and they may not be able to explain it, but they're afraid. And there's other things. And basically, people come up with a view, hang on, I don't like the way this is going, must take back control. So if I put these scenarios on this chart, I do think this pessimistic scenario is quite likely. I rate it as maybe 30% probability that the engines of innovation, that positive feedback cycle, will actually get broken. And there won't be free sharing on the internet. There won't be public sharing of information. There'll be instead fear and alienation, social chaos, driven by all kinds of things. Xenophobia, tribalism, superstition, and new dark ages. Made worse by climate change. Made worse by financial crisis. All kinds of things could make this likely. So that is the threat, which I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, that does deserve more of our attention. I'm more optimistic on the whole, uh, or more abolitionist on the whole. I think all things equal. This is about a 50% probability of happening. I don't think we're going to muddle through in the middle much. I think the odds are too great. And I think we'll get there if we can have an inclusive, compelling vision that inspires people to come along. And I'll spell that out in this, my final slide. Achieving that rejuvenating vision by 2040 will require huge amounts of hard engineering problems to be solved. Let's not underestimate that at all. It may require, as I said, maybe a million people cooperating to get that done. Some of this will possibly be done by businesses, Human Longevity Institute by Craig Venter and Peter Diamandis, Google Calico and new startups. There are more people willing to invest, but as we heard, Often that doesn't cover the fundamental research. And we may need the governments to get involved, seeing the possibility of the longevity dividend, forcibly reallocating some of the funding from other government priorities, for example, from individual diseases, to looking at aging research instead. There are certainly roles for individuals to get involved, making donations to projects that they believe in and see. And there's roles for individuals to get involved using their own time, their volunteering effort to learn more about this. Not just to contribute technically, because that's hard. Increasingly, you can be involved in winning a war of ideas, learning more about marketing, learning more about politics. Two dirty words to many people, but they're actually very important skills in which we sympathetically address the social and philosophical concerns of our critics and showing people, I know you're worried about this, but look, talking to them and also showing them by demonstrating attractive early benefits, early wins, saying, you know, you thought it was going to be horrible. Don't think about that terrible picture of the mouse with the ear growing out of its side. I know that's horrible, but here's something much more attractive. Here's something you can see in which there is early rejuvenation without drawbacks. 
Having a million people working on the same project is, could be a recipe for disaster. It's going to require excellence in collaboration. It's going to require that we don't alienate our potential allies, including allies who are currently trying to delay aging rather than reverse aging. These are absolutely our allies, and we mustn't alienate them. And we must avoid the insights being lost in the noise of too many cooks. But we have declared possibly a vision. Some of you got this in the way in. Uh, draft vision. It's a vision that I have spelt out in various ways in more detail in this uh, Abolition of Aging book, which uh, gives the 15-hour long version of the half an hour talk I've just given. It shows we can abolish aging possibly within a generation in the same way as society earlier decided to abolish slavery. It sets out a positive vision in which is more than just living longer, it's living better. It's a humanity plus vision. As I've said, I think it's about a 50% probability we can get there. But if we really set our minds to it and act wisely, we can get there faster. Thank you very much. Okay, David will take some questions. Edward. So I, am, I happen to be a life actuary and to have work on retirement systems. And I have published, or it's, uh, I have pre-published, now it's being published, um, uh, an article called uh, Do Actuaries Believe in Longevity Deceleration? Uh, because there are projections for retirement or the realistic scenario that you see here. Um, exactly the one that we are seeing now. Um, and in, in that uh, article, I have made a model that is uh, longevity escape velocity, uh, with, well, with good arguments, I think. So it's just a possibility uh, with a pessimistic scenario. It looks just very much like your slide, right? Um, and uh, the uh, associated amounts are, are huge uh, because you can imagine that uh, uh, today most people, they reach retirement. They live long under retirement. And it's a lot of money uh, for many years uh, to be paid for everyone. And we can clearly see that it's, uh, you know, it, in our lives, that's part of the big money that we, we receive. Imagine paying someone for many years, you need a lot of money for that. Uh, and that's for everyone. Uh, so it's really a, a nightmare, I would say, for the governments uh, that we live longer uh, because of that. Um, and because they are not able to increase the, the uh, retirement age very easily. In Japan, yes, uh, the, I think the official retirement age is, uh, I mean, the minimum retirement age is perhaps close to 60, and people, uh, they really, on average, stop working at the age of 70, uh, but that's an exception. Um, and, uh, and so I think a lot of it comes from here also. So when we talk about the longevity dividend, we have... On yeah, sorry. But this uh, is all good stuff. Uh, what do you think of that? So my question is more for the longevity dividend, because on one hand, we will uh, have be uh, less uh, ill, so it will be better for the costs. But on the, on the other side, it's difficult to change the uh, uh, retirement, uh, established retirement solutions. So that's why I argue we have to spell out more of the positive vision. It's not just living longer. It's actually living better. It's the humanity plus vision in which people will be able to spend more time doing the things they care about and the things they like doing. And uh, we also need a social change. I said we need politics plus plus. We need to find a way, and it's difficult to get there. It's a very difficult challenge, in fact, to reorganize the social contract uh, in which the small number of people who are still working with lots of robots assisting them, creating wealth, that somehow that wealth can be redistributed and made available to everybody without it appearing as theft, without appearing as, as a horrible socialism or whatever. And uh, the government are indeed uh, fearful in the same way. I should have added that on. And because of the fear, it gets pushed out of their mind. And as a futurist, we have to help people to face up to the future shock, to say, don't push it out of your mind. Let's think through calmly. If we don't think through calmly, we're definitely going to hit the threat. And it's better to think about it sooner rather than later, which is why I think we have to take the futurist position. Yes. I am very sympathetic to what you said, so thanks for this, uh, for this talk. The only problem that I see is uh, that all the papers that I read suggest that in C-elegance you can increase uh, 
the lifespan 10 times. Yes. The Drosophila, which is a little bit more complicated, two times. In mice, which are mammals like us, is 30% uh, maximum. So there are people uh, wondering uh, that humans are so complex, evolutionary speaking, and uh, not because of the number of genes, because the genes are, the number is relatively similar to that of uh, C. elegans, but uh, there is an unbelievable increase of regulatory mechanisms, uh, including uh, all sort of uh, thousands of RNA going around, that uh, to push the lifespan uh, over 120, just to say, 122 like Jean Calman, who can be considered an outlier, is, uh, is really tough, biologically speaking. Uh, so I think that uh, the possibility of delaying aging, which means delaying uh, the onset and progression of uh, most uh, cruel and the demanding age-related diseases could be the most reasonable scenario for the, for the next uh, decades. Of course, uh, the abolition of aging is uh, on the something uh, more challenging, uh, but as I said, humans are really tough. Uh, and the <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, that's why but, I but think. I am sympathetic, I think, of course. Yeah. You know. That's why I think. And posi positive thinking. So. Well, we need to be realistic as well as positive. We need to ground our expectations in something that can be defended, can be shown to our colleagues as credible. We can't just say this would be nice. Let's do it. I, I, I'm not sure how far this will go. I, I'm not sure, I, like you, how much genetic enhancements will change. Maybe we can all become super centenarians, but maybe then uh, we will run out at that stage, which is why I think we probably need this damage removal acting at a lower level to go in and get involved. Which of these will turn out to be the most significant? I can't say for sure, but we need lots of people researching. And surely we'll change our mind. We'll have fundamental discoveries that will change our thinking along the way. We, we must, uh have some really breakthrough, uh, That's right. which is possible. But yeah. The chances of a big breakthrough are possible if there is more people working on it and if they feel inspired to work on it. Uh, question at the back? One more. And, and then, uh, then Mark. Keep it, keep it uh, short, please. Right, I mean, the, the, these questions were all good so far, I have to say. Well, first off, I'd like to say, as a fellow futurist, I really liked your, uh, your presentation. But I was wondering, if you look at these curves, they actually kind of remind me of the progression of uh, from, process, from product to process innovation after hitting a dominant design. But when you look at the third uh, graph, the abolition of aging, where would you say that this plateau comes? Because if we can truly abolish aging, wouldn't you say that you've actually have an infinite increase in medical capability. Yes, so the, the, there might be a singularity there, in which we break out of this historical transition and we go into a totally new phase altogether. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. All right, so I mean, if you abolish aging, haven't you as effect, uh, essentially reached optimal medical capability. I mean, where does it curve off if you've actually abolished it? Well, there's still other things we can do to enhance our quality of life. I mean, we haven't said anything here about rejuvenating minds. You know, we talked a lot about rejuvenating bodies. We really live for the rejuvenation of minds and experiences as well. So there may be more ahead. We just can't foresee it. It's almost as if we were, we were like apes gathering in the African jungle seven million years ago, thinking, you know, one day we might get more intelligent. What are we gonna do with our greater intelligence? And some apes might say to each other, you know, we love bananas. Maybe in the future when we're smarter, we'll have even more bananas than now. 
some of them might have said, we love sex. We can have even more sex and even more variety of positions in the future. I don't know. But they would not have imagined Pythagoras' theorem. They would not have imagined Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. They would have not imagined going to the moons of Jupiter uh, and so forth. So I think as we enhance our bodies and minds and enhance society, the kinds of possibilities that will come to our minds are things we can't currently conceive. So that's why I just say uh, fade off in the chart there. Ask me in 10 years' time, I'll maybe give you more for what might be there. If we are closer to the singularity and I feel more confident in my ability to see in into it. <laughs> <laughs>